We are CARE. Hi, please allow us to introduce ourselves. Hi, my name is Dara. Um, I'm Black and I go by the pronoun she, her. I'm Frankie. I'm Cape Verdean and Italian and my pronouns are she, her. My name's Faria, I'm Pakistani, and I go by the pronouns she, her. I'm Stephanie, I'm Korean American, and I go by the pronouns she, her. I'm Yaila, I'm Turkish and Argentinian, and I go by the pronouns she, her. My name is Moji, I'm African American, I go with the pronouns she, her. Hi, I'm Mia Manshafir and I'm Caucasian and I use the pronouns she, her. We are CARE, standing for cultural and racial equality. Our currently all female group from Princeton, New Jersey, works to find ways to fight racism and inequality in our school. With all, with all of our diverse backgrounds and experiences, we are able to complement each other as co-leaders and share all of our unique perspectives and ideas. Our utmost mission is to find ways to reach our classmates and administrators. And with that, create the change we want to see in both our school and our town. We hope you enjoy our presentation and leave it feeling as good about our work as we do. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions during the video, please ask us on our Instagram at CarePHS, our Facebook, our Twitter at CarePHS, or on our email, carephs22 at gmail.com. So I will be presenting the what our club is and what we stand for and where our ideas st stemmed from. Next slide. So the idea of CARE stemmed from the group We Are People, which was created in late 2017. We Are People consisted of 10 students that aspired to create change within their own school community and bring awareness to the numerous instances of discriminatory language and racial jokes. Using our own experiences, we, as leaders, work to create an understanding of how detrimental these frequent occurrences can be on a student's school experience. These leaders wanted to convey this message by creating an assembling for their peers to watch. It consisted of speeches, skits, and small group discussions. After the assembling, there was controversy among staff and our peers. Some people believed that the assembling was unnecessary and would do more harm than good. Despite the negative feedback, many people congratulated us about having the ability to create a well-rounded assembling with different aspects. Since the We Are People assembling was so well received, we wanted to take our fight for racial and social justice further. Once we began our freshman year of high school, we sought the opportunity to create a club that revolved around the same message that We Are People did, hence the creation of CARE began. As a club, we saw the ability to expand our leadership team and began working with social justice leaders from other school communities at Princeton High School. As our leadership team had previously only consisted of individuals from Princeton Unified Middle School, previously known as John Witherspoon Middle School, we began working with individuals from Cranberry and Charter Middle School as well. Similar to the assembling, we wanted to revolve our weekly club meetings around small group discussions. We focused on discussing relevant issues that impacted our society in a way that was engaging and interactive. In doing this, we began utilizing interactive activities to deliver information and put things in perspective for our members. We used activities such as simulations and privilege walks and many more. Stephanie and Moji will go more in depth with these activities soon. These activities helped us learn how our difference ultimately unite us while also educating our members to make a change within our community. Moji and I will be talking about some of our care meetings that we have um, done in the past. We meet once a week and we've tried to switch there are different methods of how we educate our care members, and we have gone through slideshows where we introduce the distinctions and importance of race and ethnicity, cultural appropriation, intersectionality, and more. We have also done activities like um, a privilege walk and um, simulations, jeopardies, and more. And one of these activities was the privilege walk. 
The privilege walk was an activity where which we did in the beginning of the year where we were starting to get comfortable with each other. And for every single one of our meetings, we made sure to establish that whatever happens in here stays in here to make sure that everyone is, in, is comfortable and feeling safe. So we also made sure to establish that if you do not feel comfortable, you do not have to participate. Um, with our live audience, you can also participate in this by using your fingers. For a step forward, you can put one finger down. And for a step back, you can put a finger up. And if the statement does not apply to you, you can just keep your fingers as is. So take one step forward if you woke up and ate breakfast. Take one step forward if you do not have to worry about your monthly phone bill. Take one step back if your financial situation impacts your choice of college. Take one step forward if your family owns, more, owns two or more cars. Take one step back if your parents did not grow up in the US. Take one step forward if you can show affection to your partner without being afraid. After doing this activity, we all looked at each other and saw how we were at different levels and different places and we realized how diverse we are and how much privilege we have together. So another meeting that we did was we had a being black in America simulation. So to where this originated from was there was another like activity day that went on in our school where it, it could be about anything, any social injustice, anything that you wanted. And um, you, you put it together and you held it. We had like a, it was kind of like a, like a tiger time where if you don't know where a tiger time is, is like a free period what for like the whole school so we put it we put it together and we made it like a game on a, on a google slides so we gave you a background story which is you are an african-american male high school freshman living in present-day new york city you attend a majority white school so when so we took this we thought it worked really really well um in the activity day we got a with sorry <laughs> with um we had we had a whole hour so we could really like go like go in deep on all of them like we really went in on them and a lot of people shared really good um answers so we felt it was good to share it in care as well um and care gave us the same response so um so the prompt is you're in a cat you're in the cafeteria waiting in the sandwich line you are near the front of the line when a white kid cuts you in line, you say, excuse me, but he ignores you. You tap him on the shoulder to get his attention and he whirls around really angrily. What's your problem, he shouts. People start staring at you too. It's just that you cut me in line and I've been waiting for like 15 minutes, you reply. You black people always have a problem with something. You glare at him shocked, speechless, that he would say or think anything like that. What, you aren't going to deny it? Must mean it's true, he says in a mocking tone, coming right up in your face. With that, you lightly shove him back and he punches you in the face. A full on fight breaks out and continues until a teacher stops it. You both are sent to the principal and have separate meetings with him. You both get in trouble. However, you would later find out he merely got three detentions while you got suspended for a week. Although you technically started the physical violence, he was the one that took a lighthearted request into a deeply racist zone. So with this prompt, we give you two, um, two options on how to um, react to the situation. So A is argue that it's unfair that he only got two detentions while you had a week of suspension, even though he was the instigator of the argument, or you could do B, stay quiet because you know it probably won't get you anywhere, but instead make him hate you more. So um, the audience, you can pick which one you wanted to do. Um, I think this was, this was a response, This is the, and then we give you an outcome. So it goes on your record and lowers your chances of getting into a good college. So, and then with each slide, we give you a fact and statistics on, on your outcome or like the type of situation it was. So this fact is in 2013 to 14, about 2.6 million public school students, 5.3% received one or more out of school suspensions. A higher percentage of black students, 13.7%, 
than if students from any other racial ethnic group received an out of school suspension, followed by 6.7% of African Indian slash Alaska Native students, 5.3% of students of two or more races, 4.5% each of Hispanic and Pacific Islander students, 3.4% of white students, and 1.1% of Asian students. So now we'll show you the outcome of the other. Um, option. Next slide. Oh. Because you argued, sorry, <laughs> because you argued you got a longer suspension and now the guy hates you, your guts even more than he already did. Fact. In 2007, oh, it's the same fact. That's why I got mixed up before, sorry. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> another, um, another meeting we had was, Je uh, was our Jeopardy series. So our Jeopardy series was really fun because we had a theme for all the Jeopardy. So like for um, Black History Month, it was all about Black history. Um, and then we also had Women's History Month. So we had about women's history. So yeah, these were really fun. Everyone got really heated. Everyone wanted to win. Um, they were really good. And a lot of people walked out of them like telling us like, wow, like I didn't know that before. And they, they're learning more stuff they're more they're learning more stuff and they're educating themselves while having fun so we thought the jeopardy series was really um fun way and fun and educational way of of uh learning um so i'm going to talk about some of care's goals before corona um some of these overlap with our uh future goals as well so we really want to aim to foster an environment of inclusivity, unity, and kindness in our school and our community. We think it's really important that everybody feels safe and heard and respected, no matter what their background is, their ethnicity, their race, their socioeconomic status, we want to make sure everybody feels safe. Um, we also encourage our peers to feel like they have a voice and they have power to make actual change both in our community and in the world, both in little ways and big ways and in any way they can. And we also try to discuss current and world events both in our community, in the nation, and also globally, and figure out what we can do in our community and globally uh, to change these things and what little steps and big steps we can do to change these. Slide. So we also aim to have weekly discussions um, and we have roundtable discussions on social justice topics. Right now we're mostly racial justice topics, but we're going to expand that later. Um, but we try to use loose guidelines and we feel like this really fosters a feeling of creativity and gives our members some freedom to really take the conversation where they want to and gives a lot of room for debate and for this fluidity and for it to feel really natural and be like a real debate and not feel super structured and give people the chance to say what they really want to say. We also really aim to stop complacency in brushing things under the rug. Um, in our area, it is very liberal and it's a more wealthy middle class area. And we really want to stop this whole idea of complacency that we find around us a lot. A lot of times people say they hold these liberal views yet when they actually experience and see racism in their day to day life, they don't call it out. And we want to change this and we think helping our peers do this is the perfect way to do this. Um, we also, as I said before, want to create a safe environment for our peers because we want to make everybody feel safe and respected and heard. Slide. Um, also, as Steph and Moji said before, we want to make sure that we do interactive activity activities. Uh, we did the privilege walk that we found really got people to really connect and we found it made a really big difference. People were like, wow, I didn't realize how much privilege I had. And it made people really appreciate like what they do have. And it also covered topics, not only in racial injustice, but also in um, terms of like sexuality and socioeconomic status. And it allowed for that to really cover, a, uh, for us to really cover a big blanket of social justice issues. Um, we also did the Being Black in America simulation. We got a lot of really positive feedback on this and we've had some really great deep conversations and some people really opening up about their experiences as well. 
Um, we also really wanted to, especially because we live in such a white area and we go to a predominantly white school, we really wanted to give some people a, an insight into the black experience, experience in America because it is so different from the white experience in America. And we think that's really important to understand, to put somebody else, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Uh, we found the Black History Month Jeopardy really, really helped up our participation and it also brought in a lot of new members. People had so much fun and we found it really important to talk about and help educate our peers on Black history that isn't just about slavery. A lot of times in schools, all you learn about when it comes to African Americans is slavery and that's about it, but there's so much rich culture there and so much that happened that is totally forgotten and we thought that was really important and a lot of people learned a lot of new things. And we also did the agree disagree scale discussions where we had one side of the room be strongly agree, the other side be strongly disagree, and then let people stand on the scale depending on how much they agreed or disagreed with statements we read. We also found that um, brought up some really good debates and discussions about some conversations that even within our group was really interesting to see the different perspectives. That also really helped. We found that these really encouraged participation and also they keep it fun and they bring in a lot of new um, members. Slide. How has care changed during the pandemic? Due to COVID-19, the way we went about our meetings, events, and activities adapted under the difficult circumstances. While our stances remain the same, the club as a whole quickly became more and more active on social media. We did our best to make sure that our messages of social equality was still heard through the screens of our community. During the first few weeks, we made informational posts about books to read and movies to watch in order to stay sufficiently informed under the circumstances. Some of these included Marshall, Iron Jawed Angels, and Boy Erased. After George Floyd's death, we started posting about ways to actively fight against racism, as well as the different ways that racism is used against people of color. Additionally, we launched an IGTV series, Care to Be Aware. These videos share the stories of several people of color that died at the hands of police brutality and racism as a whole. Among these were Emmett Till, Trayvon Martin, and Sandra Bland and Tamir Rice. One example of our IGT videos covered the recent events in racial injustices. Hey everyone, we hope you're well during this time. In light and everything that's happened in the US and all over social media, we thought it would be appropriate to use our platform and address everything within our club and our community. Our goal is to inform everyone about what's been going on in recent events and possibly provide instruction on ways to affect change to steer our country away from racially motivated violence. Over the past few months, we've been seeing several instances of racially motivated hate crimes resulting in the deaths of unarmed people of color. Among these are George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery. These are the only ones that have received media coverage. Many more have happened. On February 23rd, Ahmad Arbery was shot point blank and killed while jogging one afternoon because he was identified as a potential suspect for local robberies. A few months later, on March 13th, Breonna Taylor was shot eight times after police charged her, charged into her apartment, warranted by a search for narcotics. Most recently, on May 25th of this year, a 46-year-old black man named George Floyd was killed as a result of police brutality. The officer knelt on his neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. He pleaded for the officer to get off, but the officer did not want to comply. Floyd was originally stopped for the use of counterfeit bill. The mayor of the town said about the incident that she didn't see anything unreasonable. These three deaths were unwarranted and unjust. Additionally, there are so many other incidents that have taken place over the past few months that aren't being recognized. So we've been seeing a lot of posts online and spreading awareness through the media. There are still many steps that we can take of people in the white community to help people of color. Being informed is the first step. Being informed is crucial to maintaining awareness and prevalence of the issue in America. Continuing to show and share information such as current cases with friends and family is a local way to show your support 
and bring attention to the issue. Opening your eyes to your own privilege is also very important. White privilege does exist in America and systemically. White people benefit from the oppression of people of color in our government and in America every day. Speaking up and speaking out will help demand justice for people of color who have been abused by racism and is still in our world. But through and through, remaining an ally to advocate for people of color through all of this will help fight for equality. Use your privilege to help other people in our community, people of color especially. It is very important that we use this voice that we have been given by a broken society to help fix it. It is impactful to push in a story as you are spreading the message to more people, but it should not end there. Once your story disappears in 24 hours, please continue and contribute to fight against this issue. You can do this so by signing petitions, calling, and texting to the demand justice for the victims of, the, of these hate crimes. The information for that is in one of our most recent posts, and you can use the link in our bio. Also, please stand up to racism every day whenever you see it, and not just on social media. So in response to the recently reported victims of hate crimes, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, many people have come out of their homes in the midst of a pandemic to fight against this hatred. People are risking their health and their lives to fight for the justice of these victims. These were very, these were initially peaceful protests to uh, honor the victims, and they still are, but they were quickly escalated by the police's response by using tear gas and rubber bullets. In tear gas, you are unable to see and breathe, and someone has, um, a girl has, uh, has even died from it because it triggered her asthma. Um, it, rubber bullets seem much uh, uh, less impactful than real bullets, but in reality, it's a huge metal bullet that is encased in rubber. And uh, it's, used, it's meant to be used at a long distance, but uh, the police are using it straight at the face, which has caused people to go blind. Um, and this, uh, police's response is in contrast the, to the police's response to the pandemic quarantine um, protests where they um, declared for freedom and saying that it's my body and they pushed around the police yet the police did not respond with tear gas and rubber bullets. Additionally, in 1965, 600 peaceful protesters were fighting for the right to vote without obstacles like poll taxes and literacy tests and made their way from Selma to Montgomery. Soon after their march began, local law enforcers attacked the crowd with tear gas and beat them with clubs. There's a lot of similarity here between this and what took place within these protests that we're seeing now. Almost 60 years later, we're virtually in the same place as a country. We can do better. We have to. This is what you can do as a bystander in the situations of witnessing police brutality. You can start by recording the incident and stating your right to do so. Send the recording to as many people as possible as soon as you can. This will ensure the videos are saved. Right after the incident, remember to quickly jot down the information you know. Also try to remember or take a picture of the names and badge numbers of the officers involved. Any information about the people engaging in crime is essential information. Additionally, filing a complaint of police misconduct by recording the time, date, location, and other details or facts about the officers is another action you can take. However, the most important thing is to stay safe. This can be done by standing back, getting other people to help, or any other actions that will maintain your own protection. Thank you all for watching this very informative episode of our series called Care to Be Aware. We hope we've given you enough information that can potentially help you make strides towards racial justice and equality for these victims of police brutality. Our DMs are always open, so feel free to DM us any questions or anything else along the matter. Hey everyone, we hope you're well. We then made a point to share the stories of people of color at our own school with care amplifying your voice. For far too long, instances of racism at our school were dismissed. We decided it was time that they were heard and acknowledged. Over 50 students shared their stories. Some of them are portrayed on the screen here. We made a very clear statement that jokes should never be based off of stereotypes, racism, and or sexism as that is very prevalent at our school and in our community. 
Another post shared, in history class, I saw people making fun of the, the slave that were brutally beaten in a documentary. They also made comments saying that racism is irrelevant in today's society. In middle school, a white peer told me, a black student, that if I were back in slave times, he would be my slave master. I was with some friends of mine and I had a Chinese friend next to me as well. We were all joking with one another and making fun of an, each other when someone took it too far and told my Chinese friend, at least I don't eat bats for dinner. I was so shocked and I had a loss of words. It was absolutely disgusting. I was having a debate with these people in a group chat, majority of them from my school about police brutality, not to mention I am black. So I was advocating for Black Lives Matter. They were siding heavily with the police officers and I believed that blue and believed that blue lives matter. I asked the, honestly to one of the person in the group chat that was my friend, if I got pulled over and got out of the car and off and a police officer shot me, would you side with the police officer? They proceeded to say, well, you wouldn't have gotten shot if you didn't do anything wrong. These are only a few examples of instances of injustice and racism that people in our school have experienced. We did our best to stay in touch with our members over the summer with comments about political cartoons and various opportunities to remain active and fight injustice. With the help of our undeniable social media presence and well-established platform, we became a common source of information and social guidance. While we strive towards the same goals, the steps we take in achieving it have changed. Our focuses have become more centered around paving the way for voices of people of color to be heard and educating peers about history, how to be active during the pandemic in the community and the Black Lives Matter movement. Throughout quarantine, our platform has also expanded to a all form of social equality. Faria will now talk more about how we plan to continue with care in our future. Okay, so now I'm going to explain CARE's goals for the future, but some of our goals align with our pre-corona goals, so here we go. One of our goals is to expand our outreach, which includes opening up CARE chapters at other schools around the nation. We also aim to create an inclusive environment for our peers, as well as emphasize the need for changes and improvements in our society. We also want to create a safe space for everyone who attends our meetings. Another goal we have is to open our discussions to other areas of social justice, such as gender identity and sexual orientation. Just because CARE stands for cultural and racial equality doesn't mean that our conversations are limited to that. Our goal is to open up each other to these hard conversations and learn more about each other. Uh, and lastly, our, we'd like to gain more members from varying grades and genders. If you have any questions, here are our social media handles. So Instagram is at CarePHS. Our Facebook is uh, CareEdCollab. Our Twitter is at CarePHS. And our email is CarePHS22 at gmail.com. If you have any further questions, you can contact Yaila with her Instagram handle, or you can contact me, Faria, with my Instagram handle. Thank you so much for attending, and we hope you all have a great day.